Hello, I'm Dr. DeBellis. Thank you for joining me today. I'd like to talk to you about drugs of abuse. Particularly, I'd like to talk to you about the neurochemistry of how, how those drugs affect the central nervous system. As we discussed in previous lectures, neurochemistry focuses on the basic chemical composition and processes of the nervous system. Uh, there we focused more on endogenous ligands such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Today we're going to talk about neuropharmacology, which is the study of compounds that selectively affect the nervous system. And here we're going to be talking about exogenous ligands such as barbiturates and stimulants. Hopefully you recall from our last lecture that a ligand is a substance that binds to a receptor molecule and has an effect. We have endogenous ligands, which are the ones produced in the body, and then we have exogenous ligands, which are produced outside the body. We're going to be focusing on exogenous ligands for this talk. I'd also like to remind you we have different subtypes for neurotransmitter receptors. We have 14 for serotonin, 5 for norepinephrine, and 5 for dopamine. And they seem like they have slightly different uh, effects on the central nervous system whenever they're stimulated. And these different subtypes are constantly changing their concentrations and response to behavior as well. So a, a little review, an agonist is a ligand that initiates the normal effects of the receptor, whereas an antagonist blocks the receptor from being activated by other ligands. And an inverse agonist initiates an effect that's the opposite of the normal function. Drug tolerance develops when successive treatments have decreasing effects. One example of this is metabolic tolerance. That's when organ systems become more effective at eliminating a drug. For instance, if somebody consumes alcohol regularly, we would expect that there would be an increase in the enzymes that actually break down the alcohol. Therefore, whenever they use alcohol in the future, we could expect that it would it would actually break down quicker. We would say they have a higher level of metabolic tolerance. Now that's different from functional tolerance. Functional tolerance is where a target tissue may show altered sensitivity to the drug. So we might find, for instance, that there are, uh, there's down regulation of the number of receptors. We don't have as many neurons or receptors as a consequence of, of abusing a drug. So changes in number of receptors can alter sensitivity in the direction opposite to the drug's effects. So receptors, for instance, downregulate in response to an agonist drug. So that means when an agonist activates them, there are less. But then they will upregulate in response to an antagonist. So whenever they're not receiving enough stimulation, more of them will actually be available. Now, cross-tolerance is tolerance to a whole class of chemically similar drugs. Um, withdrawal symptoms may be caused by drug tolerance. And sensitization occurs when the drug's effects become stronger with subsequent treatments. Now, there are eight common ways that, that drugs manipulate the presynaptic membrane. And again, this is the presynaptic membrane. We're actually looking at an axon terminal here. Um, the first is levodopa and, and Wellbutrin are precursors. This is what we call precursor therapy, in which we increase the synthesis of, uh, of neurotransmitters. Another method uh, would be such as in, in the case of ketamine, ketamine, we can decrease conduction velocity by inhibiting the sodium current. Other drugs such as reserpine interfere with storage of the neurotransmitters in the vesicles. So you probably recall that this right here is a vesicle, and the vesicle is sort of like a life raft. And if you think of the enzymes that are floating around in the cytoplasm as sharks, uh, basically packaging these, these um, neurotransmitters into the vesicles actually protects them from the sharks. Um, unfortunately, these are, are um, leaky life rafts, uh, whenever we have reserpine, what it does is it, it makes the, the membrane of the vesicle leaky, and it also interferes with um, a membrane protein that, that actually brings the neurotransmitters into the vesicle. Um, 
We call it VMAT, vesicular monoamine transporter, um, but we'll get into that later on. Now, drugs such as caffeine, they'll actually interfere with the role of neuromodulators on the presynaptic membrane. So you probably remember when we talked about um, how when certain monoamines are released, they're released with uh, adenosine, and it actually works as a negative feedback loop that actually turns off the rate of production, kind of like a thermostat in your home. Now, drugs such as tricyclics and SSRIs, they interfere with reuptake. Remember, whenever a neurotransmitter hits a receptor, two things typically happen. Either it's um, reuptaken or it's degraded. In the case of reuptake, that's when the neurotransmitter actually crosses back over to the presynaptic terminal and it re-enters into the presynaptic membrane. Now, whenever this is blocked, it's akin to having extra players maybe in a basketball game, not taking any out for breaks, actually keeping them in for a longer period of time. Uh, you can probably imagine what would happen if a coach left eight players on the court for a basketball game. Clearly, there's going to be an advantage there, right? So this is how tricyclics and SSRIs um, increase the bioavailability of amines in the synapse. Some drugs also interfere with axonal transport. And drugs such as MAO inhibitors prevent the breakdown of neurotransmitters, thereby increasing their bioavailability in the synapse. Now, drugs can also work on the postsynaptic membrane. So if we venture to the other side of the synapse there, we have a postsynaptic membrane. We're going to talk about some ways that drugs can affect the central nervous system in the postsynaptic membrane. So there they can attack enzymes like uh, monoamine oxidase or acetylcholinesterase um, that degrade ligands, such as the monoamines and acetylcholine, respectively. Here we see the, the monoamine there, those red circles. If, if one were to take an MAO inhibitor, those would disappear. Um, drugs can also affect activity in the postsynaptic membrane by degrading the number of receptors. So they can remove some of those receptors and that's going to decrease the amount of activity in that pathway. Drugs such as antipsychotics can even antagonize the remaining uh, receptors so graded potentials are less likely to occur. So we talked about antipsychotic drugs and how they have a, a propensity toward uh, antagonizing dopamine 2 receptors and that seems to uh, relate to their efficacy. Now other drugs, like one we'll talk about, LSD, they agonize receptors and increase the number of braided potentials that occur in the postsynaptic membrane. And finally, some drugs, such as lithium, actually interfere with the G proteins in the intracellular space heading to ion channels. You probably recall from earlier lectures I talked about how we have these membrane channels. We have the ionotropic, which are pretty quick acting, but the G protein coupled channels in the membrane, whenever they're activated, they release this G protein that floats around in the intracellular space. And as a result, um, whenever it finally hits a um, channel in the membrane, it will actually cause it to open up almost like an ionotropic receptor. So we're going to explore many of these drugs in much more detail in this lecture. We're going to explore caffeine and alcohol, probably the two most commonly abused drugs. Um, then we're going to talk about narcotics, cannabinoids, nicotine, barbiturates, stimulants, and hallucinogens. So we're going to start with my favorite drug, caffeine. Um, caffeine's a really popular drug. It's really socially acceptable. It's kind of funny. Sometimes I'll, I'll go into the coffee shop and people are excited to get their caffeine and they're pointing to the newspaper next to them talking about how beneficial caffeine is to their health and to their, to their mind. Um, caffeine has several biochemical effects, but only blockade of A1 and A2A receptors for adenosine 
has effects that operate at doses that you're going to find in a cup of coffee. But blocking of GABA-A receptors, stimulation of calcium release, and inhibition of phosphodiesterase all require higher doses even into the toxic range. Adenosine in the brain has neurotransmitter-like function, and it's been proposed as a key modulator in inducing drowsiness and sleep. The stimulant properties of caffeine depend on antagonism of adenosine receptors in the brain, especially in the striatum, which is part of the basal ganglia, where it interacts with dopamine to modulate locomotor activity. So now I'm going to show you a diagram. Here you have a uh, presynaptic terminal. So this is going to be an axon terminal. And here you have a dendritic spine. And as you can see, these yellow circles are going to be catecholamines, and this red one's going to be this adenosine, this neuromodulator. Here we have an adenosine receptor, which is actually on the presynaptic membrane. And on the postsynaptic membrane, we actually have the catecholamine receptors. But modulators such as adenosine affect either transmitter release or receptor response via this negative feedback loop. So here you can see the vesicle full of catecholamines also has a little touch of adenosine in it as well. Now caffeine's an exogenous neuromodulator that blocks the effects of adenosine. It antagonizes that red adenosine receptor. Um, so it's an endogenous neuromodulator that normally inhibits catecholamine release, adenosine is. And here we're going to add caffeine. Um, so Acute caffeine intake leads to several physiological effects, including increased blood pressure and respiration rate and enhanced water excretion and stimulation of catecholamine release from the adrenal medulla. So here we can see that vesicle approaching the presynaptic membrane. It's released. So here we're going to see the adenosine actually traveling to that red adenosine receptor and it's actually going to slow down the rate of release of catecholamines. Now if caffeine was incorporated into this, if we want to see how caffeine affects it, caffeine again it's an exogenous neuromodulator that blocks the effect of adenosine, an endogenous neuromodulator that normally inhibits catecholamine release. So if the subject had consumed coffee prior to, to this, um, and we're, caffeine here is going to be uh, the green puvule here that's blocking the adenosine. So as you can see, when the vesicle is released, uh, the adenosine ma makes its way to the adenosine receptor. The catecholamines go to the postsynaptic catecholamine receptors. And as you can see, the adenosine was actually denied access to the receptor because it was being antagonized by the caffeine. The net result is going to be that you're going to end up with a great deal of catecholamines in the synapse. Next, alcohol. Alcohol is a little more complex. We're actually going to be talking about four different neurotransmitter pathways when we talk about the effects of alcohol. Um, alcohol has a long history, and there are very strong um, attitudes about alcohol. Uh, next to caffeine, alcohol is the most frequently abused drug, and it's been used for millennia. And, and alcohol abuse traces back to the Dutch distillation of gin. Um, and in the 1830s, Americans launched the temperance movement to reduce alcohol use. In the 20s, the the prohibition movement outlawed the marketing, manufacturing, and even importing of ethanol, and chronic alcohol abuse results in inadequate nutrition leading to health problems and brain damage. Um, we can see this um, oftentimes if you work in an inpatient setting, uh, patients will need to detox. They will actually go into an encephalopathy and they will exhibit uh, Korsakoff's confabulation. Um, they'll look like they have dementia. Oftentimes they will recover after detoxification, even though you will have residual deficits typically, especially in the area of memory. It seems whenever somebody's alcohol abuse affects their memory ability, uh, especially memory consolidation, 
that those, those problems tend to be ongoing for many patients. Now, most alcohol is metabolized by the liver, and chronic alcohol abuse damages the liver. Alcohol dehydrogenase converts alcohol to acetaldehyde, which is then converted to acetic acid by acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Um, and enzymes in the cytochrome P450 family also convert alcohol to acetaldehyde. Cytochrome P450 enzymes metabolize many other drugs, and if alcohol is consumed with other drugs, they must compete for the same enzyme molecule, um, and the drug molecules can accumulate to dangerous levels. So this is the reason that prescription and over-the-counter drugs oftentimes have warning labels regarding alcohol consumption with the drug. So alcohol dehydrogenase converts alcohol to acetaldehyde, which is then converted to acetic acid by acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Interesting finding is that 10% of Asians have genes that code for an inactive form, and drinking alcohol results in buildup of toxic acetaldehyde, causing flushing, nausea, and vomiting, tachycardia, headache, and dizziness. If alcohol is consumed with other drugs, they must compete for the same enzyme molecules, and the drug molecules can accumulate to dangerous levels. Some alcoholics experience the DTs, or delirium tremens, which can include convulsions, hallucinations, disorientation, panic attacks, unstable blood pressure. We're going to talk about how this happens on a molecular level. Um, alcohol also increases impulsiveness, and we're going to talk about why that happens. I also want to point out, contrary to myth, alcohol doesn't invent aggression. Alcohol has only been demonstrated to contribute to aggression, and those who have a history of aggression, um, and those who believe alcohol will cause them to become aggressive. Alcohol also stimulates do dopamine pathways, causing the euphoric effects, which last for six hours. And alcohol abuse also damages nerve cells, especially in the frontal lobe, yet some damage is reversible. The frontal lobes are the most affected by chronic alcohol abuse, yet some effects are reversible. Typically, whenever I see chronic alcohol abuse, um, the patients oftentimes will have certain uh, telltale signs, a combination of uh, ventriculomegaly, particularly in the fourth ventricle, uh, which, is, con which uh, is consistent with um, cerebellum atrophy. Um, oftentimes, they also have periventricular white matter changes, which are on the T2 flare. Now, brain damage that occurs after many years of heavy alcohol consumption is caused by the alcohol the elevated acetaldehyde, also liver deficiency, as well as inadequate nutrition, uh, particularly the deficiency of thiamine or vi vitamin B1, which is critical for brain glucose metabolism, and this causes cell death. And this particularly seems to affect the mammillary bodies, which are part of the limbic system that's really important for encoding new memories. A syndrome we sometimes see when we look when we're um, assessing chronic alcoholics is Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. It's characterized by confusion, disorientation, tremors, poor coordination, and ataxia. Uh, ataxia is related to the to the atrophied cerebellum. In later stages, the patient remembers the remote past, but almost nothing about what goes on around them. Oftentimes, they will confabulate which means they'll fill in the blanks with things that they see whenever they're having memory failure. And thiamine treatment can stop the degeneration, but it doesn't reverse it, especially for memory. Um, some of the research uh, shows that executive functions tend to recover um, uh, significantly. However, memory functioning oftentimes is, is not as, as resilient with treatment. Heavy alcohol use can lead to fatty liver, alcoholic hepatitis, and alcoholic cirrhosis. Um, in fatty liver, the triglycerides accumulate in liver cells, and alcohol is metabolized first, leaving the fats for storage. Um, 
Now, an alcoholic hepatitis liver cell damage apparently is caused by an accumulation of high levels of acetaldehyde. And in alcoholic cirrhosis, death of liver cells stimulates scar formation, and blood vessels carrying oxygen are cut off. I found as a clinical psychologist, it's been very, very useful to consult with um, treating physicians who can provide information about patients' alcohol abuse. Because if we're not aware of their alcohol abuse, which is sometimes the case, um, it can be very, very um, easy to misdiagnose or, or even just not to be able to feel confident in our diagnoses of our patients. So this is something that we always want to be aware of when we're trying to understand how we can benefit our patients. Alcohol readily crosses cell membranes, including the blood-brain barrier, and uh, nonspecific actions result from changes in membrane lipids. Uh, alcohol interacts with the polar heads in the cell membrane. It alters lipid composition, and it disturbs the relationships of proteins distributed in the membrane. It also interacts with specific sites on particular proteins and influences several ligand-gated channels and alter second messenger systems. And we're going to talk about how that happens. We're going to examine this on a molecular level. Um, so we're going to talk about how alcohol affects glutamate receptors, how it affects GABA receptors, how it affects dopamine receptors, and then finally, um, how it affects the endogenous opioid system, the endorphins. Alcohol has its greatest effect on NMDA receptors. These are ligand-gated channels that allow calcium and sodium to enter and cause localized depolarization. Um, so this is glutamate here. The, the light blue circles down here are going to be glutamate. And these are glutamate receptors. And um, here we can see the vesicle of glutamate approaching the presynaptic membrane and then it's released. Now alcohol actually is going to antagonize those glutamate receptors, those NMDA receptors will cause them. And here comes more glutamate, another vesicle. Now check this out, the postsynaptic membranes are actually gonna uprate the NMDA receptors, or the glutamate receptors, in an attempt to restore the activity. So you have in abundance, now look at how many of these, these NMDA receptors are there. And then you end up with another vesicle being released of this glutamate. And as a result, you have an abundance. Now when the effect of the alcohol wears off, the combination of increased bioavailability of glutamate and increased availability of NMDA receptors leads to overactivation of the receptors. Uh, you probably remember from a previous lecture when I talked about how glutamate in large amounts can actually lead to something called excitotoxicity. Um, here we find that whenever the, the receptors become available and there's this huge abundance of glutamate, um, this overactivation of the receptors is correlated with central nervous system hyperexcitability and seizures, which are typical of alcohol abstinence syndrome. So this would be consistent, for instance, with the, the DTs or delirium tremens. So um, now for detoxification, to prevent this, benzodiazepines such as uh, Librium and Valium are actually prescribed to prevent alcohol uh, withdrawal symptoms. And this is very important because um, there are some drugs that people can detox off of without having serious, um, fatal, potentially lethal side effects. Um, unfortunately, alcohol is not one of those drugs. If somebody um, is trying to quit cold turkey and they've been drinking excessive amounts of alcohol for a very long time, it's important that they detox under the supervision, the supervision of a physician who has access to these drugs, which can be prescribed um, to prevent these withdrawal symptoms. Now, alcohol affects learning and memory because 
it is a glutamate antagonist and it reduces glutamate release in many brain areas, including the hippocampus, which we've discussed the hippocampus is very, very important. It's the most important area of the brain whenever it comes to memory consolidation for declarative memories. Uh, it's also very important for spatial memory. So alcohol binds to these GABA-A receptors, like a benzodiazepine, and it opens the channels allowing chloride to enter the cell to hyperpolarize the membrane. Hopefully you remember what hyperpolarize means from our previous lectures. Hyperpolarizing means it e means making the intracellular space even more negative than the extracellular space. So alcohol increases the um, chloride flux and stimulates GABA release. And alcohol acts on some GABA-A receptors, but not others. So here we are. We have uh, GABA, which is gamma amino butyric acid. Um, and here it is in the vesicles. And then you have the GABA-A receptors. And there we have alcohol. So alcohol, the red circles, it increases um, chloride, which stimulates GABA release. And some GABA receptors are activated by alcohol as well. So here we see the alcohol diffusing across the synapse. It's hitting those same receptors that the GABA would hit, causing these graded potentials that are going to hyperpolarize. So the combination of the free-floating GABA in the synapse along with the alcohol increases the level of hyperpolarization. And this is probably what leads to the sedating effects of alcohol. Alcohol also acts as an agonist on receptors in the dopaminergic mesolimbic system. So this is a part of the midbrain that goes into the limbic system that produces a great deal of dopamine. Um, and it plays a significant role in the reinforcement and motivational mechanisms. We talked before about how dopamine is really important for the reward systems of the brain, things that we pursue, things that we find rewarding. As we can see, alcohol actually trips out the system. So the orange there is going to be dopamine, those orange spheres, and then we have the orange dopamine receptors on the postsynaptic membrane the vesicles transporting the dopamine, which is then released into the synapse. And then whenever it crosses over, it causes action potentials. Now, if we added alcohol, it increases activities in these synapses by antagonizing these receptors, especially in the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens is a part of the basal ganglia. This is very important for um, pleasure pathways and reward pathways. Um, it's where the caudate nucleus meets the putamen. Finally, alcohol um, affects the endorphin receptors. And this is one of the ways that it contributes to the reinforcing effects of alcohol. So not just the dopamine system, but the endorphin system. So you can see why alcohol has such a, an addictive potential. Acute administration of alcohol increases endogenous opioids. These are going to be the endorphins and enkephalins. Um, it, it increases their production as well as their release. So here we have the red spheres again are going to be um, alcohol, and the gold ones are endorphins. And then finally, on the postsynaptic membrane, we have the endorphin receptors. But you can see that these vesicles full of um, endorphins um, release them into the synaptic space, and acute administration of alcohol increases these endogenous opioids, uh, their production and release. So we can see the activation there. Now for detoxification, benzodiazepines such as uh, Librium and Valium are given to prevent the withdrawal symptoms. The next class of drugs that I'd like to talk about are narcotics. Opium contains morphine, which is an effective analgesic or painkiller. Morphine and heroin are related and both are highly addictive. And now we have, um, so these opiates, they bind to opioid receptors in the brain, especially in the locus cerealis and the peri 
aqueductal gray. So the locus aurelius is actually going to be in these areas down in the brain stem. And then the periaqueductal gray is actually going to be over here. And uh, now carfentanil is 10,000 times more potent than morphine and 100 times more potent than fentanyl. Um, to give you an idea of how powerful fentanyl is, back whenever Silk Road was operating, this was a website that was based out of San Francisco, and people could buy drugs. Um, you could go there, you could purchase online through the dark web, you could purchase, you know, crack, heroin, marijuana, whatever you wanted. Um, but the owner of Silk Road actually took fentanyl off the menu. Basically, they felt that, you know, if you wanted to get crack, they could help you to get really good crack. But fentanyl, that's just, that's so powerful. That just, we, we won't be a part of that. It's too addictive. Um, as you can see there, these are lethal doses of heroin, fentanyl, and carfentanil. So you would need that much heroin probably in order to overdose. For fentanyl, not really that much. I mean, um, but then carfentanil is, again, 10,000 times more potent than morphine. So these are very powerful drugs. Um, now, opioids contribute to the reinforcing effects of alcohol in the same way that they also stimulate these opioid pathways. Acute administration will actually cause these action potentials or these graded potentials. Now we're going to talk about cannabis. Marijuana is derived from cannabis sativa and its active ingredient is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, which we're going to call THC. The effects vary. They include relaxation, mood alteration, elation, stimulation, hallucination in some cases, paranoia, and sustained use can lead to addiction. Now, oftentimes people ask, well, is it psychological or physiological addiction? And I want to point out, we want to be careful with, with that question of, is it, is it psychological or is it physiological? Because those aren't two neat compartments that you can separate from each other. Um, they sort of blend together. So I think that's kind of a loaded question. Now, the brain contains orphan cannabinoid receptors to mediate the effects of THC and other compounds. Endocannabinoids are homologs of marijuana produced in the brain, and they act as retrograde messengers, and they may influence neurotransmitter release from the presynaptic neuron. Now, psychotropically, cannabis sativa typically causes an alert and energetic high, whereas cannabis indica causes a relaxed and lethargic high. So, but marijuana is a complex mixture of cannabinoids. Over 200 have been identified, and other molecules and other risks um, benefit ratio of this mixture has not generally been well defined. Anandamide is an endocannabinoid, so it's produced inside the body, and it leads to altered memory formation, appetite stimulation, reduced pain sensitivity, and protection from excitotoxic brain damage, which we talked about with too much glutamate. Now, humans produce endocannabinoids, including anandamide and 2-AG. And here we can see how the anandamide works. So the anandamide is going to be these red circles here. And this is an interesting um, synapse here. This is what we call a... Um, synaptosynaptic, or I'm sorry, this is what we call an axoexonic um, synapse here. And basically what's going to happen is the anandamide is actually going to be released and it's actually going to hit this axon terminal here. And here you can see glutamate is being produced. As you probably recall, glutamate is the most common excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. And here we have two vesicles making their way down into the synapse. And then we have the receptors for the glutamate there. And what happens in the case of anandamide is um, 
you can see this vesicle of glutamate has been released. But as the anandamide actually approaches that um, exoaxonal synapse and it's released, what it does is it activates these um, CB1 receptors, we're going to call them, and that actually causes the release of glutamate to stop. So over time, there's going to be a decreased amount of glutamate because of the activation of these red CB1 receptors. Now, if we were to administer THC, we could expect that there would be an even stronger reduction in glutamate bioavailability in the synapse because of the fact that you have that additional activation of these exoaxonic um, synapse uh, this is over here the receptors of these CB1. So, but anandamide is an endogenous ligand. It's involved in binding THC and CBD to endocannabinoid receptors. And this 2AG is also an endogenous ligand, and it's involved with neuromodulation and CB1 receptors and both naturally occurring cannabinoids such as THC and CBD and synthetic cannabinoid molecules can bind the human endocannabinoid receptor and have biologic activity. Now currently the cannabinoid biology is not fully understood. Um, clinical trials have identified areas of therapeutic potential for these molecules. Those include uh, as an analgesic for chronic neuropathic pain, also appetite stimulation and debilitating diseases spasticity and multiple sclerosis, cachexia, and finally it's sometimes used with um, chemotherapy associated nausea and vomiting. So it seems to have a lot of promise in these areas. Um, now regardless of the species, the main active ingredients currently utilized for the desired medicinal effects are the uh, Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, a psychoactive cannabinoid, and then uh, cannabidiol, CBD, for non-psychoactive cannabinoid. And the buds and leaves of the plant are smoked, vaporized, and or cooked um, for their effects. And the cannabinoid extractions may also produce therapeutic benefits, such as the, the percentage of THC or CBD can be assessed and manipulated. So now two legal synthetic forms of marijuana are available in the U.S. and approved by the FDA. There's a Dronabil, I'm sorry, Dronabinil, uh, or Marinol, which is a Schedule Three oral medication approved for the Food and Drug Administration for the treatment of AIDS-related wasting, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Um, it's a capsule which must be taken whole orally, and it may prove problematic in the in the face of nausea or vomiting. The third form of legal medical marijuana is known as Sativex. It's a cannabinoid-based oral mucosal spray, currently approved in Canada and the UK for symptomatic relief of neuropathic pain and multiple sclerosis. Um, next, we're gonna talk about nicotine. Nicotine increases heart rate, blood pressure, hydrochloric acid secretion, and bow activity. It works by activating nicotonic cholinergic receptors, um, one of the two subtypes of acetylcholine receptors. As we talked about um, in a different lecture, we talked about how we have nicotinic and, and um, muscarinic receptors for acetylcholine. But these nicotinic receptors um, there are receptors in the ventral tegmental area. Uh, nicotine also increases dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens, which is probably related to its reinforcing and addictive properties. But acetylcholine is a ligand, nicoton, nicotinic and uh, muscarinic receptors. And here we can see these, these uh, um, gold spheres in the vesicle or acetylcholine. These are going to be acetylcholine receptors, in this case nicotinic receptors, and then here's nicotine, the, the red circles here. But as the vesicles of acetylcholine approach the presynaptic terminal, they're released in the synapse, 
and they operate the same way as nicotine. They basically activate these um, acetylcholine receptors, these nicotinic receptors. They do it the same way. So it's like you're increasing it through agonist uh, therapy. Now in smokers, nicotine produces a calm or relaxed state, partly as relief from nicotine withdrawal symptoms. Nicotine administration in non-smokers tends to elicit heightened tension or arousal, along with lightheadedness, dizziness, or even nausea. It's very interesting if you think of ever trying a cigarette when you're younger as, as a result of peer pressure and finding it to be a, an aversive experience. This is consistent with the research that shows that, yeah, whenever one is administered nicotine, um, it can actually have aversive symptoms if they didn't choose to. But the mesolimbic dopamine pathways from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus cumens play a key role in the reinforcement. So again, this is the dopamine and increased acetylcholine activation likely leads to the cognitively enhancing effects. Keep in mind, acetylcholine is the major neurotransmitter involved in the rest and digest effect. It's not surprising that Many smokers report that whenever they light up a cigarette, they actually feel relaxed. They feel kind of at peace. It's their way to decompress. Um, now, increased norepinephrine activation may be responsible for the heightened arousal. And tobacco smoke contains other compounds as well that inhibit uh, monoamine oxidase. In one study, non-smokers were given a nicotine by skin patch and uh, then performed a test on a computer keyboard. And nicotine treatment led to significant decrease in errors of omission. So errors of omission are like failing to notice something or failing to respond to a target. Um, and they also showed an increase in a measure of composite attention as well. So it seems like the cognition promoting effects of, of uh, nicotine have been documented in the literature. And that's not that surprising if you look at some of the, the, the um, drugs that actually operate on acetylcholine pathways, such as um, Exelon, Aricep, Razodyne. These are all cholinergic drugs that have been used in an attempt to manage the cognitive symptoms of dementia. Now, nicotonic receptor agonists are being considered as treatment for Alzheimer's disease, and high smoking rates in people with schizophrenia. Um, maybe this is an attempt to self-medicate for their cognitive deficits, because keep in mind, individuals with schizophrenia oftentimes do have cognitive symptoms. Um, now, animal studies also show the cognitive effects of nicotine. Um, now we're going to talk about stimulants. Um, cocaine's a stimulant and a um, sympathomimetic that produces symptoms of sympathetic nervous system activation. So the fight or flight response, increased heart rate, vasoconstriction, hypertension, and hyperthermia. Leaves from the cocoa shrub alleviate hunger, they promote endurance, and they enhance the sense of well-being. Now, by the 1850s, German chemists had isolated and characterized cocaine, um, and cocaine use became popular as many doctors and scientists lauded its properties, the most famous, of course, being Sigmund Freud. He recommended it for treating many ailments and declared that it was non-addictive. I believe he left two of his interns to write a paper, to work on the paper, actually. He didn't think they'd finish it, but apparently they finished the paper, and uh, it sounds like they also finished cocaine as well, as they wrote this paper on all the great benefits of, of cocaine. And whenever Sigmund Freud returned, he was really impressed by how much work they had completed. Um, and this was actually published. Um, Afterward, whenever he realized the addictive um, properties of cocaine, he actually tried to have uh, the paper retracted and annulled from scientific journals. But cocaine's the purified extract of the cocoa leaf, and it can be used as an anesthetic, and it increases catecholamine activity, but it's highly addictive. Now, the D3 receptors have an important role in cocaine's rewarding 
and reinforcing effects. Cocaine individ independent individuals um, show abnormal prefrontal cortical functioning manifested as deficits in inhibitory control and evaluating consequences uh, of their behavior, as well as impairments in verbal memory, attention, and motor function. And you can probably imagine how um, having trouble with an inhibitory control is going to further then perpetuate one's drug abuse. Now, catecholamine transporters, uh, such as nor uh, norepinephrine transporter, um, dopamine transporter, um, they drive catecholamine reuptake, which decreases bioavailability of the norepinephrine and dopamine. So what this means is we actually have um, a transporter here. What it does is it takes catecholamines out of the synapse and it packages them back safely into a vesicle. And uh, this transporter uh, could be NET or DAT. It could be norepinephrine transporter, dopamine transporter. We're, we're not going to, it could be either for the, for the sake of this diagram here. So um, here the red circles are going to be catecholamines. These are going to be catecholamine receptors on the postsynaptic terminal. And here we can see the vesicle making its way uh, to the presynaptic membrane and releasing the catecholamines, such as dopamine and norepinephrine. And after they cause these graded potentials in the postsynaptic membrane, they will then make their way to the transporter protein. Now, if the individual is taking cocaine, it would actually block this transporter protein, and there couldn't be any reuptake of the norepinephrine or dopamine, which you can imagine would lead to an abundance of norepinephrine and dopamine, a great deal of bioavailability, which is going to increase the um, local potentials in the postsynaptic membrane. So we're going to have a great deal of dopamine and norepinephrine activity as a result. So cocaine binds most strongly to the serotonin transporter, followed by the dopamine transporter, and then the norepinephrine transporter. But blocking dopamine reuptake appears to be the most important for cocaine stimulating, reinforcing, and addictive properties. Now, dual dependence is addiction to the effects of the interaction of two drugs. So, for instance, cocaine plus alcohol will produce a unique metabolite called cocaethylene, which has activity similar to cocaine, but a longer half-life. And research shows that longer periods of access to cocaine can lead to an escalation of intake that in turn downregulates the reward circuit, presumably making cocaine even less rewarding. So, um, now amphetamine or methamphetamine works differently. It's a synthetic stimulant that resembles catecholamines in structure. It was first synthesized in 1887. Um, amphetamine and methamphetamine are metabolized by the liver at a slow rate, and they cause the release of neurotransmitters even in the absence of ac abs action potentials. And the way that they do this is, earlier we talked about these catecholamine transporters that are blocked when one uses cocaine. And here are, are catecholamines, these circles, and we've got the catecholamine receptors. In the case of am amphetamine, we don't just block. Um, so methamphetamine enters the dopamine nerve terminals via uptake by um, dopamine transporter, and they cause the vesicles to release their dopamine. The dopamine's then transported out of the cell by a reversal of the dopamine transporter. So what essentially happens is this transporter doesn't transport the catecholamines, or the dopamine in particular, um, back into the presynaptic terminal. It actually pumps it out. So you actually end up with an even greater flow of dopamine into the synapse, a great deal of bioavailability. And look at how um, much dopamine you have there in the synapse. So the short-term effects of amphetamines include alertness, euphoria, and stamina, but long-term use leads to sleeplessness, weight loss, and schizophrenic symptoms. Uh, there's a really good um, 
book called Whispers, the Voices of um, Paranoia by Ronald Siegel. I, I highly recommend it. It, it talks about um, cases that he's had to be an expert witness on where he talks about the type of paranoia that's caused by ingestion of large amounts of methamphetamine. So um, it's worth checking out. It's a good book. But norepinephrine releasing effects of, of amphetamines occur in the brain and uh, in the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response. And consequently, these compounds have potent sympathomimetic actions similar to those seen with cocaine. Amphetamine causes heightened alertness, increased confidence, feelings of exhilaration, reduced fatigue, generalized sense of well-being, delay in sleep onset, uh, and sustained physical effort without rest. Um, dopamine sort of the, the molecule for um, getting things done, for being motivated to finish projects, to work on projects. And it can enhance athletic performance as well, which is why it's banned in athletic competitions. Um, but it has very highly reinforcing effects. It's been used effectively for the treatment of narcolepsy as well as attention deficit disorder. Um, now, psychostimulants in low doses produce a calming effect. It's a paradoxical effect in more than half of children with ADHD. And individuals with ADHD have many of the same symptoms as people with the damage to the right prefrontal cortex. And brain imaging studies have, have found abnormalities um, in the right prefrontal cortex in, in patients with ADHD. Now, Arnst and et al., they, they argue in their research that the prefrontal cortex functioning is an inverted U-shaped function of the activity of both the catecholaminergic systems, and that the action of stimulants and non-stimulants is to enhance this activity in the prefrontal cortex and that dopamine activity in the prefrontal cortex may be deficient for these ADHD patients. So it's this idea that we have this underactivation and that we need to have kind of the perfect middle ground amount. Um, hallucinogens. Hallucinogens such as LSD, mescaline, and psilocybin, they alter sensory perception and they produce peculiar experiences. Hallucinogens have diverse neural actions on serotonin, norepinephrine, and acetylcholine systems, which lead mainly to visual effects. We don't necessarily have hallucinations. They're just altered visual effects. One of the reasons for this is it seems like the serotonin pathways are really important in the neuromodulation of um, information, incoming information. If you think of how much information is actually making its way into the brain, all the different neurons that are simultaneously providing information, um, it's sort of like too much information. And it's been offered this idea that serotonin actually downregulates and it neuromodulates the amount of information so we don't have too much information to make sense of it. On a molecular level, LSD resembles serotonin in structure, and it acts as an agonist on serotonin receptors, especially in the visual cortex. So here we have serotonin, um, and here we have serotonin receptors, and orange circles are going to represent LSD. So there are the serotonins released into the synapse, where it causes um, activation, one of the 14 different serotonin receptors. If LSD is ingested or taken by other means, it's going to have the same effect. It's actually going to activate these receptors, mostly in the serotonin system, um, and that's actually going to lead to these visual effects. Now, fencyclidine or PCP or angel dust is a dissociative drug. It produces feelings of depersonalization and detachment from reality. Um, its many side effects include combativeness and catatonia, and it's been proposed as an alternate chemical model for schizophrenia. We're going to talk about the um, predominant chemical model for schizophrenia when we talk about psychopathology. It's the dopamine model, but this, this has actually been 
a second um, model that's been proposed for schizophrenia. But PCP is an M MDA receptor antagonist that stimulates dopamine release. Now ketamine or special K is a less potent an MDA antagonist that works in the prefrontal cortex. Um, and like PCP, it can produce transient psychotic symptoms at high doses. Ketamine is also uh, showing a great deal of efficacy as a treatment for um, treatment-resistant major depressive disorder. So it blocks these NMDA receptors, and PET scans of the brain indicate it also increases activity in the prefrontal cortex. And while high doses of ketamine produce transient hallucinogenic effects and occasional psychiatric symptoms, low doses are useful as antidepressants. Ketamine is interesting because it's a drug that has different effects depending on the dose. Um, now, 3,4-methylindioxamethamphetamine, or MDA, also called ecstasy, is a hallucinogenic amphetamine derivative, and its major actions are increases in serotonin levels and changes in dopamine and prolactin levels. So um, the two neurotransmitter pathways that are most affected are dopamine and serotonin. Now we discussed the effects of dopamine and serotonin. Dopamine is really important for uh, reward pathways. Serotonin is really important for social dominance or feeling socially accepted or valued. Um, this is consistent with um, the, the immediate effects that individuals who take MDMA sometimes report that they feel a, a part of humanity, they feel connected and valued by others, and they also feel very um, happy. That's the euphoric effect. Chronic ecstasy use produces persistent effects and damage to these serotonin producing um, uh, neurons. Um, now I want to talk about four models of drug abuse. We have the moral model, the disease model, the physical dependence model, and the positive reward model. The moral model blames the abuser for a lack of moral character or self-control. So uh, this would be kind of like the just say no movement. It's, it's just uh, focusing on the the lack of moral character if you use drugs. Now the disease model, which is a more medical model, it focuses on the abuser's need for medical treatment. Um, I like this model because keep in mind when an individual has an addiction we do have to get them into treatment, especially if it's something like alcohol. If somebody has just detoxed uh, cold turkey and they've been abusing um, liquor for a long period of time, we want to see to it that they meet with a medical doctor to prevent them from uh, having serious withdrawal symptoms. Um, one of the challenges with the disease model is that an abnormal condition in abusers has not been identified. We typically refer to these as, as biomarkers. We have not found the golden biomarker for um, alcoholism. The physical dependence model called the withdrawal avoidance model, it says that abusers use drugs to avoid withdrawal symptoms. And in some cases, this is the case. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, a movie such as Train Spotting, where they show the horrible uh, withdrawal symptoms individuals face whenever they try to detox. Um, we also find this with alcohol as well. Um, but the positive reward model uh, offers the perspective that a lot of drugs of abuse actually don't have these strong withdrawal symptoms. Um, and therefore, drug use is a behavior controlled by the positive rewards, more so than, than avoidance of withdrawal symptoms. Now, many addictive drugs cause dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. Again, this is a part of the basal ganglia. It's in the anterior junction where the, um, the caudate nucleus meets with the putamen, but some axons that terminate here originate in the ventral tegmental area of the midbrain and are involved in the reward pathway. Uh, the addictive power of drugs may come from stimulating this pathway, and experimenters found that rats will activate 
dopaminergic stimulation, the reward pathway to the exclusion of eating. So they'll stop eating in order to hit a lever that will actually activate this pathway. Another pathway may involve the insula, which is a brain region within the frontal cortex. And it's also been noticed in clinical cases. Patients with damage to this area have been able to stop smoking effortlessly. Um, some of them report that they don't have an aversion to pain. When asked if they feel the pain, they say, yeah, I feel it. It just it doesn't really bother me that much like it used to. So these pathways, again, they're going to originate here in um, the midbrain. Then they're going to actually make their way up into the nucleus accumbens and the basal ganglia where they're going to exert their rewarding effect. There are some factors that raise one's susceptibility to addiction. It's, it's been known that there are some biological factors such as one's sex or their genetic predisposition. Also family situation, um, broken families, poor relationships, having siblings who are drug abusers raise your likelihood of engaging in drug abuse. Also, personal characteristics such as aggressiveness and emotional control uh, are related to uh, susceptibility to addiction. And then finally, environmental factors such as peer pressure and social factors, as, as one can understand. Now, environmental stimuli can become associated with the effect of the drug. We find this in uh, cue-induced drug use, which is uh, uh, increased likelihood of using a drug because factors are present that were also present when the drug was last used. It's really fascinating to think of all the unconscious forces on behavior that we're not aware of that can relate to um, drugs. For instance, from time to time we hear about somebody who overdoses and uh, we find out that they had used a great deal of the drug that they overdosed on, but the specific time that they had the lethal overdose, they'd only used a fraction of that much. And the question is, why is it that a quarter of the normal amount that they used actually causes them to overdose? And one of the explanations that's been offered is whenever you see any cue that's associated with your um, drug of use, that your liver starts pumping out enzymes in anticipation of the drug being ingested or snorted or inhaled. Um, and that whenever you don't see any of these cues, you don't have that head start. Your liver doesn't have that head start in order to um, detoxify it. So that metabolic to tolerance uh, doesn't happen quick enough. Therefore, when people are in novel settings that they'd never use the substance in, it can raise their likelihood of experiencing overdose. Um, but this all happens at an unconscious level, which is really fascinating. Now, medications are used to treat drug abuse, and they're really useful for this. Um, some physicians are, are um, board certified now in addiction medicine. This is a new uh, subspecialty. It's a great area. Now there are drugs for detoxification that they prescribe, such as benzodiazepines, um, such as Librium, um, and drugs to help ease the withdrawal symptoms. Also they have agonists or analogs of the addictive drug. And we see this, uh, these partially activate the same pathways as the drug. Um, and we find this for instance with methadone or um, nicotine patches, um, also, we have antagonists to the addictive drug, and they block the effects of the abuse drug, but they may produce withdrawal symptoms. And then finally, we've we have medications that alter drug metabolism, like antabuse, uh, which makes drinking produce unpleasant side effects, such as flushing, irritation, and nausea. Now, reward-blocking medications, they block positive reward effects of the abuse drug, but may produce a lack of all pleasurable feelings. And anti-craving medications reduce the appetite for the abuse substance. And then finally, immunization prompts the immune system to remove the targeted drugs.
So now we have finished uh, our talk about the um, neurochemistry of drugs of abuse. I hope that was useful for you, and hopefully you can join me for our next lecture on the endocrine system as it relates to behavior. Thank you so much for joining me.